Hello, my name is Seth Murray. I'm a priest in the Old Catholic Communion of North America, where I've been very grateful to be serving for a few years now. Prior to that, I was happily in the Roman Catholic Church for approximately 25 years, and for almost 25 years before that, happily part of various Protestant evangelical churches. My goal in this video is to present a paper that I wrote about a year ago, and I've been asked to talk about this several times and comment upon it, decided us to present the paper. It's titled, Papal Supremacy is False and an Obstacle to Unity. It is a great miracle that the Church has lasted 2,000 years, and it is an even greater miracle that it has done so with people like you and me in it. This was from one of my favorite professors of theology uh, when I was studying for my master's degree in theology in the Roman Catholic Church, Father Michael Mazowski. He's a great encouragement to me and to my wife and our family. During the first centuries of Christianity, the church in Rome rightly came to be held in high regard among the churches. Rome was the final resting place for countless Christian martyr martyrs, including the apostles Peter and Paul. However, as, as the centuries passed, the Church of Rome increasingly mistook the honor and respect it received for actual secular power to rule over the Christian churches around the world. Promoters of papal power fabricated histories and letters promoting the idea that the Pope had unilateral, universal, immediate authority over the entire Church. This eventually led to claims that a refusal to submit to the Pope would result in eternal damnation. The Church of Rome and people acting in its name began to excommunicate, replace, and violently attack and kill non-compliant Christians, leading to the greatest schism in Christian history, and one that continues to this day. Roman Catholic apologists and evangelists routinely say that all are called to communion with Christ, and that this entails communion with Rome. The primary obstacle to unity is our own stubbornness and sins, but there can be no authentic unity while Rome continues to persist in this aberrant error of papal supremacy. And after nearly 1,000 years of unnecessary division, it's time for the Roman Catholic Church to renounce and repent of papal supremacy and related errors, so as to open the way for Christians to once again be in full communion with each other and with our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. Now, what exactly is papal supremacy? Some background is in order. The New Testament and other historical records demonstrate a variety of ministries in the various Christian communities. Among these are the ministries of deacon, priest, bishop. Bishop is one of the English translations of the Greek term episkopos. Another is overseer. Bishops were, and still are, priests, elders, chosen and consecrated to have oversight authority over groups of churches. Bishops are considered to be the successors to the apostles and representatives or vicars of Jesus Christ. And they are the ones primarily responsible for the spiritual and sometimes material wellness of the people in their care. Priests, deacons, and others assist them in this ministry. I'm very grateful for my own bishop. Bishops by nature are all of equal spiritual authority relative to each other. However, as Christianity grew, an administrative hierarchy developed among the bishops. One or more bishops would oversee each diocese, a collection of individual parishes, and the leading bishops in a large city would be called the Metropolitan or Archbishop in other terms. The Metropolitan often helped to organize many smaller nearby dioceses. Above the archbishops was the Patriarch. The Patriarch was the highest administrative position for a bishop, and he acted as the organizer and visible head for a larger geographical region. The Patriarch was often involved in the selection, consecration, and appointment of bishops within his geography, as well as general administration and inter-patriarchate communications. The most famous regional churches in the first several centuries of Christianity were centered in Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. 
each had its own patriarch or pope, pope meaning papa, and is the common and formal title for a patriarch. Priests and deacons make oaths of obedience to their bishops when they are ordained, and as such the diocesan bishop has immediate authority over the priests and deacons in his diocese. The relationship is different among bishops. There is no oath of obedience among them, and any hierarchy or regulation among bishops is largely a matter of convention. It's grown over the centuries. Bishops are generally not to insert themselves into another bishop's diocese without invitation by that bishop. If a problem arose among diocesan bishops, the general custom was to appeal to the metropolitan for a resolution, or perhaps even a patriarch. When no resolution could be achieved, a synod, a meeting of bishops, would be held and they would collectively determine how to deal with the problem. Problems among patriarchs or patriarchates often involved an appeal to another neighboring patriarch, or to Rome, or the calling of a large synod that involved the patriarchs. In all of this, the Church of Rome was held in high regard for its association with the persons and martyrdom of especially Peter and Paul. It also sometimes acted as a court of review, not necessarily overturning the decisions of other bishops, but reviewing disputes to see whether they might benefit from further hearing in an appropriate venue, which was usually another neighboring patriarchate or diocese. Papal supremacy goes beyond papal primacy. To include the idea that the bishop or patriarch of Rome has immediate authority over not only the churches in and around Rome, but the entire church. He can unilaterally overturn the decisions of other bishops, and his authority cannot be countered or overridden by any other earthly person or group of people. That is a council. The idea had been burbling among various Roman proponents for centuries, but received its most explicit expression in the 19th century Council of Vatican I. Citing from the Council document, we teach and declare that according to the Gospel evidence, a primacy of jurisdiction over the whole Church of God was immediately and directly promised to the blessed Apostle Peter and confirmed on him, conferred on him, by Christ the Lord. It was to Peter alone that Jesus, after his resurrection, confided the jurisdiction of supreme pastor and ruler of his whole fold. Whoever succeeds to the chair of Peter obtains by the institution of Christ himself the primacy of Peter over the whole church. The Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff hold a worldwide primacy. The Roman Church possesses a preeminence of ordinary power over every other church. And this jurisdictional power of the Roman pontiff is both episcopal and immediate, both clergy and faithful, of whatever right and dignity, both singly and collectively, are bound to submit to this power by the duty of hierarchical subordination and true obedience. And this not only in matters concerning faith and morals, but also in those which regard the discipline and government of the church throughout the world. Vatican I doesn't use the phrase papal supremacy, but repeatedly refers to the Pope's authority as supreme. It effectively redefines the older phrase papal primacy to mean much more than it was generally accepted to mean in early Christianity. While some in the Roman Catholic Church were inspired by the decrees of Vatican I, many were disturbed, as has been the case throughout history. Rome's attempts to expand its power and exercise it over others actually caused another schism in Christianity, leading to the formation of the Old Catholic Church. What is papal? Oh, excuse me. What papal supremacy is not? Two phrases are often used in confusing and incorrect ways in relationship with papal supremacy apostolic succession, and papal primacy. Papal primacy and apostolic succession are both fully legitimate, historically confirmed practices and beliefs held by the early Christian Church and still practiced today. There is some entanglement or overlap among these, but each really is a distinct principle. 
and neither is the same as papal supremacy. Papal supremacy is not papal primacy. As noted above, there is clear evidence from early Christian history that the Church in Rome and the Bishop of Rome were both generally held in high regard by the greater Church of Christ. Papal primacy refers to the historical and authentic concept that the Bishop of Rome was considered as a kind of greatest among equals, primus inter pares, or to use a contemporary analogy, a kind of chairman of the board. Proponents of Roman power increasingly spoke or wrote in more consumptive terms, but such claims were generally ignored by the rest of the Church, until and unless Rome attempted to actually act on them, at which point the rest of the Church typically responded with a firm no thank you. Papal supremacy is not apostolic succession. Roman Catholic apologists, and even just devout Roman Catholics, are often a bit narrow-minded when it comes to apostles, bishops, and especially the Pope. I was, myself. Given the typical rhetoric, one might think that it was basically Jesus, Peter, and just some rabble. For example, the historical record indicates that every bishop was considered a vicar of Christ, whereas the contemporary Roman Catholic Church reserves the title only for the Pope. Historically, every bishop was considered to have received the keys from Christ via the Apostles, whereas the Roman Catholic Church asserts that they were given only to Peter, except when it does not, but more on that later, and so on. Now, apostolic succession refers to the, the authentic historical practice of delegating the authority that Christ gave to the apostles onto the bishops selected by them or their representatives, and so on and so on, right up to the present day. Consequently, today's valid bishops are those who are part of that long lineage of spiritual succession going back to the apostles. For example, my own bishop, Archbishop Robert Burgess, traces his lineage back to Thomas the Apostle, whereas Archbishop Michael Nesmith traces his to Peter. Now, why does this matter? The Roman Catholic Church asserts that the Bishop of Rome is designated by Christ himself to be the central figure of unity for all of Christianity and the sole vicar of Christ. Culpable refusal to be in communion with the Pope is refusal to be in communion with Jesus Christ himself, and places one's salvation in peril. If Roman Catholicism is correct in this respect, then this has far-reaching consequences. It is not a matter to be taken lightly. Papal supremacy has some historical proponents, and it is compatible with select biblical passages, but it doesn't seem to fit. It doesn't necessarily follow from the larger historical data, Specifically, we have no clear evidence from Scripture or from the early Church, that is, the first millennium, but especially the first few centuries, that papal supremacy was intended by Christ, was the general practice of the early Church, or that the larger Church accepted it. There is sub substantial evidence that papal supremacy was expressly rejected by the historical Church. In Roman Catholic apologist arguments for papal supremacy, These are often non sequiturs, or otherwise lead to internal <clears throat> theological contradictions in their own tradition. The scriptural evidence. Roman Catholic apologists tend to highlight four elements from scripture when maybe making a biblical argument for papal supremacy. One, the event in which Christ calls Simon the Rock and gives him the keys. Apostle possible type or analogy in Isaiah, Jesus' exhortation to Peter to feed my sheep, and instances where Peter appears to be leading or is first among the apostles, going into each of these in depth would be a long work, so we'll briefly address each. You are Peter, and upon this rock. Matthew 16 reads as follows, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, 
or one of the prophets? And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. We can consider each statement from verse 18 forward and simply ask, if this is true, does it necessarily follow that the present-day Pope has supreme, immediate, unilateral authority over every Christian in the world? Before doing so, though, let us be clear, clear about what it means to say that X necessarily follows from Y. To say that X necessarily follows from Y is to say that if Y is the case, then X must be the case. It must be true. For example, let's say that all mammals are animals. If Spot, a dog, is a mammal, then we can know with certainty that Spot is an animal. It necessarily follows from all mammals are animals, and Spot is a mammal. However, consider the statement, all students are human beings. It does not necessarily follow that Stephanie, a human being, is a student. She might be a student, or she might not be. Now let us consider each statement from the Matthew passage, and whether papal supremacy necessarily follows from that statement. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. No, papal supremacy does not necessarily follow from this statement. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. No, it doesn't follow from the claim that hell will not defeat the church, that the bishop of Rome is the supreme ruler of all the church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Also no, but we'll come back to this one. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. No. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. No. Now these may be compatible with papal supremacy, but it doesn't follow from any of these that the present-day Pope Francis has exclusive, unilateral, universal authority over the entire church, let alone that Peter did. Indeed, just a few sentences later, Jesus is calling Simon Peter Satan and telling him to get lost. And a few paragraphs later, chapter 18, the Gospel records Jesus as stating the following to his disciples. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The keys, binding and loosing, might indicate the power to allow or deny access and to establish behavior or moral norms. Some sources suggest that binding and loosing have to do with forgiving and not forgiving or retaining sins on behalf of God. Either way, the powers of both regulation and forgiveness were both clearly granted to at least all of the apostles. And their writings suggest that they passed these on to at least the bishops and priests. At this point, the Roman Catholic apologist generally, generally makes one of three follow-up claims. Well, papal supremacy might not be clearly proven by any single passage, but it's proven if we take these several ones together. You might say the keys were given only to Peter, indicating Peter's unique governing power. Or he'll ask you to provide evidence that his position is false. Kind of saying, well, you must prove me false. Otherwise, I'm right. For this, we need to consider formal logic for a moment. Most adults can make accurate judgments about simple, immediate inferences. For example, if all dogs bark, then the following immediate inferences are quite obvious. Some dogs bark. Uh, this dog over here barks sometimes. And there are no dogs that do not bark. And others could be derived. When we move from simple immediate inference to inferences that depend upon two or more premises, though, 
mistakes become common. And the more complex and subtle the argument, the more likely that there will be an error in the process of sorting through it. For this and other reasons, the reader is strongly encouraged to take some solid courses in formal logic. In a serious discussion about a controversial claim, this is important, it's the responsibility of the proponent to demonstrate that his conclusion is true. Ask him to do so. If he can do so, then perhaps my position is wrong, and I need to change. And in such a case, we can be thankful to our friend who showed us this new truth. Avoid making the other person's argument for him, or if you must, ask him to confirm that you've accurately represented his position and reasoning. Whether the argument succeeds, whether its conclusion should be accepted as true, depends on its structure as well as the truth of its premises. If any of the relevant premises are false or even doubtful, or if the argument's structure is invalid, then that argument fails to demonstrate or prove its conclusion. Keep in mind that the conclusion might still be true, even if the argument happens to be flawed. Demonstrating that an argument is flawed doesn't disprove the conclusion, that is. It only means that the argument doesn't prove the conclusion, and so does not constitute a compelling reason to accept or believe the conclusion. That is, disproving a conclusion requires a sound counter-argument. That itself can be a lot of work. Hmm. I know that's boring. But here's one of the claims we need to examine. So one of the premises that's often put forward, only Peter received the keys. A deep sigh is appropriate here, as this is little more than an attempt to do what the Roman Catholic apologists generally accuse Protestant apologists of doing. That is, they're engaging in sola scriptura. Specifically, Roman Catholic apologists making this claim are attempting to argue that they're being one passage, a passage, that records the keys being given to Peter, and no passages indicating them given to anyone else, that this proves that they were for Peter alone. Note the addition of the word alone there. Of course, Scripture nowhere states that the keys were given to Peter alone, and in making such an argument, apologists are employing clever tactics they routinely condemn in others. It's important to note that the point isn't being rejected because it represents hypocrisy on the part of the Roman Catholic apologists, but because it is just fundamentally irrational. It just so happens that it's also hypocritical. But there's a second problem. Multiple ancient sources, as well as the Roman Catholic Council, state that the keys were given not only to Peter, but to all of the apostles. For example, in the Fourth Lateran Council, the Roman Catholic Church asserts regarding the Eucharist, Nobody can effect this sacrament except a priest who has been properly ordained according to the Church's keys, which Jesus Christ himself gave to the apostles and their successors. Roman Catholic apologists can dismiss individual theologians, even saints, as we often do, when the theologian's position is inconvenient or otherwise wrong, but they cannot readily dismiss what the Roman Catholic Church claims as an ecumenical, even an infallible, counsel. Of course, some will quibble with that. They'll, they'll say, well, not every word is infallible. Uh, not this sentence, maybe, or that sentence that maybe we don't agree with anymore. A consistent, honest Roman Catholic apologist has a tough choice. He can admit that the keys were not given only to Peter, that Lateran IV was not an ecumenical, infallible council, or that ecumenical councils are not really infallible at all. I've never encountered a Roman Catholic apologist who was willing to engage in this trilemma, except one that attempted to argue that words don't mean what they mean. Most aren't even aware of this historical situation or the statement in Lateran IV and elsewhere. Shifting the burden of proof. It's common for amateur apologists or experienced ones that are being rather underhanded to shift the burden of proof. This is when someone makes a claim and rather than demonstrating that the claim is true, 
The person implies or states outright that his claim should be accepted as true unless you can prove and provide evidence that or an argument to the contrary. Both evidence and sound argument can be presented against papal supremacy, but we need to be careful not to fall into these traps. We need not believe a claim simply because someone has asserted it, and no counter evidence has been presented. Rather, as rational creatures, most of the time, or maybe some of the time, we need we need believe something only when and if it has been shown to be true. The stranded cable analogy, that is, uh, argumentum ad infinitum. Some apologists claim or imply that even if no single argument clearly demonstrates his point, that the collection of arguments stacked or bound together does so. Some will appeal to an analogy like a stranded cable to imply that a very strong argument can be made by weaving together many weak arguments. The apologist is making two horrific reasoning errors in this process. The first is arguing by analogy. Arguments by analogy are generally garbage. But this is even worse because the analogy isn't being employed to attempt to make the main point, but to try to justify the method of argumentation itself. It doesn't follow from the fact that several thinner strands can be bound together to make a strong cable or rope, that several inadequate, fallacious arguments necessarily come together to make a strong or valid one. The proponent is invoking a known invalid form of argumentation to try to justify an invalid argument. And from there it is turtles all the way down. The second error is the implicit invocation of authentic argumentation while filling the content with garbage. Specifically, it is the case that some truths that are not easily demonstrated through direct immediate inference can be demonstrated through a complex of inferences. However, to do so requires actually following some rules of validation, some rules and principles of logic that have been tested and proven over time. I've never, ever encountered someone who is invoking the stranded cable principle who is actually following rational rules of argumentation. And if someone plays this card, the appropriate response is simply, no, 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 we don't have time for that right now. Because arguments for papal supremacy have recently become quite popular, I've actually asked some of the leading Roman Catholic apologists uh, from Catholic Answers and elsewhere, uh, many whom I deeply respect and admire. I've said things along the lines of, that's a good argument you've made, but it's not valid and it's not sound. Can you give me a valid sound argument for papal supremacy? And I get one of two replies. Three, actually, one of three. One of the replies is just silence. Or some type of diversion, deflection. The other reply is, you need to read or buy my book. When, and I've read, I've read so many books, I'd, and I'm so busy, I don't have a lot of time to uh, read someone's book just because they, they, uh, they say it proves, proves their point. The third reply, unfortunately, has usually been, well, you, Seth, you are dumb, <laughs> which might be the case. Uh, in any event, we'll move on. An argument that's become very popular in the last few years is this uh, typological argument from Isaiah. I've written a separate paper specifically on it. I've attempted to politely engage the uh, proponent of this argument, Suan Sana. He seems like a wonderful man. And I've been blocked from his from his YouTube channel. And, uh, and he doesn't seem to want to really uh, discuss the essence of his argument. In any event, it being the official position of the Roman Catholic Church 
that the keys were given to all of the apostles, remember Lateran 4, we really need not even address the invocation of Isaiah. But we might as well do so briefly in the interest of being thorough. Isaiah chapter 22 reads regarding Eliakim. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. And I will fasten him like a peg in a secure place, and he will become a throne of honor to his father's house. Now, Roman Catholic apologists assert that Jesus' words in Matthew are referencing this Old Testament passage, and that Peter is the fulfillment thereof. Jesus seems to have a working familiarity with Isaiah. He cites it elsewhere, but there are several problems. First, Christ never actually says, as it is written, or provides any other hint that he is invoking this or any idea from Hebrew scriptures in the Matthew passage. We see in other places where he was invoking an idea, a writing like that, he would often say, as it is written. The next two sentences after the cited passage indicate how Eliakim will ultimately be a complete failure. Perhaps there is a connection parallel there between Isaiah and Matthew, and that a few sentences later in Matthew, Jesus calls Simon not rock Peter, but Satan. This prediction of a failure is worthy of further contemplation, as Rome's attempts to dominate the worldwide church have caused an incredible amount of damage to the body of Christ. Even if Jesus was making this connection with Isaiah, it doesn't follow from this that later bishops of Rome have supremacy over the whole church. And finally, the Roman Catholic Church's own declarations claim that the keys again were given to all of the apostles, and not only Peter, so it seems difficult to push this too far. These problems seem insurmountable. Feed my sheep. The Gospel of John recounts the reunion of Peter with the resurrected Jesus. In the interaction, Jesus exhorts Peter to feed my sheep. As with the keys, Roman Catholic apologists assert that this exhortation was some kind of exclusive appeal to Peter alone, and that it indicates a special elevation of him above and over the other apostles. As the reader may be recognizing, there is a common thinking error here, which is to confuse what is compatible with what is rightly necessarily inferred from the text, from the source. That is, papal supremacy is compatible with the interaction, but it's not necessarily inferred from it. We can't rationally get from feed my sheep to you alone and your successors, select successors, are the unilateral rulers over all Christians. Peter leads the apostles. Roman Catholic apologists rightly point out that Peter is prominent and outspoken among the apostles. However, as above, there's simply no getting from Peter was prominent among the apostles to Peter therefore had exclusive unilateral authority over the entire church to the present-day bishop of Rome has exclusive unilateral authority over the entire church. It doesn't follow from the fact that Peter is recorded as often blurting out whatever came to his mind that Christ was appointing him and all of his successors in one specific part of the world as leaders of the church, but none of the other apostles. So-and-so promoted papal supremacy. In an ideal situation, we can confirm disputed claims through personal experience. But this is impossible when it comes to claims about historical events prior to our existence or otherwise outside of our experience. All we can do is rely upon claims made by others, ideally eyewitnesses, and contemplation of what is possible or impossible. Consider Christ's resurrection. None of us can go back in time and directly participate in the event so as to confirm or disconfirm Christ's resurrection via personal experience and witness. We don't have direct knowledge of the historical event. Rather, we're dependent on other people's claims and whether our current experience and reasoning confirms these claims. If the question was simply whether some people believed in papal supremacy, 
then we have a clear affirmative answer. Yes, some did. However, there's a difference between whether people say something is or was the case and it actually being the case. Lining up people who agree with me is not evidence that my position is true. It's only evidence that some other people held the same belief or maybe still hold it. We might take into account the intelligence, the education, or enlightenment of the people who agree with me, but even very good and clever people can be wrong. Worse, some may actually be engaging in deception. To the negative, we have no ecumenical council that clearly articulates or supports papal supremacy. And the responses by the rest of the church when Rome attempted to exercise such imagined power clearly show the rest of the church did not believe that Rome had authority. Altogether, it is at best unclear from the historical record whether papal supremacy was the case. What is clear from the historical record is that most of the church outside of Rome did not believe it was the case and considered Rome's attempt to exercise it to be acts of schism and heresy, a state that has persisted and compounded to this day to everyone's harm. The apologist could easily answer, it is possible that the rest of the church, excuse me, is it possible that the rest of the church was wrong? Well, yes, it is possible, just as it is possible that Rome is wrong. Some apologists will point out, well, councils had to be approved by the Pope, they'll say. Here the apologist is implying the following argument. If a council had to be approved by the Pope to be considered ecumenical, then papal supremacy is true. Councils had to be approved by the Pope to be considered ecumenical. Therefore, papal supremacy is true. This is a valid, simple, trivial argument. However, a valid argument doesn't necessarily demonstrate its conclusion. And conditional premises, such as premise A, are notoriously confusing to people unfamiliar with formal logic. Premise A is actually false rendering the argument valid but unsound. Why can it be said to be false? Well, for a conditional statement to be true, there can be no situation where the antecedent, that is the beginning of it, the part after the if, is true, and the consequent, or the part after then, is false. So, is it possible for a council had to be approved by the Pope to be considered ecumenical, to be true, and papal supremacy to be false. Excuse me, papal supremacy is true to be false. Yes, and this is because, pre precisely because it is the actual nature of ecumenical councils and the role of patriarchs, including the Bishop of Rome. For a council to be ecumenical, it did not require the approval of only the Pope. It required the approval of all of the patriarchs and the bishops in their geographies. Of course, maybe not everyone would, would agree, but leave. <laughs> As I note, this is a slight oversimplification. But if any patriarch did not approve of a council, then it would not be considered ecumenical, the binding upon the entire church. In other words, it is possible to claim that, an ecumen that ecumenical councils had to be approved by the Pope and for papal supremacy to be false. Roman Catholic apologists often conflate a rejection of papal supremacy with a rejection of papal primacy or the Roman papacy entirely. I've encountered this many times, the statement basically, well, if you don't believe in papal supremacy, you what you, you don't believe in the Pope? You don't believe there's a Pope? In this weird entanglement of these ideas. They might also suggest that belief in the papacy necessarily entails papal supremacy. This is an error. One can fully accept that the present Bishop of Rome, the Pope, is the symbolic successor to Peter and the leader of the Church in Rome, but still rationally reject papal supremacy. Same holds true for apostolic succession. One can rationally hold that apostolic, apostolic succession is true without also agreeing with papal supremacy. The Bishop of Rome as a symbol of unity. 
Unity with one another is a good, desirable thing. Christ prayed fervently that his followers would be unified, would be one. Roman Catholic apologists can rightly point out to a number of early church figures who asserted that being in communion with the church in Rome was a manifestation or a sign of that unity. Failure to be in communion with Rome represented a defect and a possible schism. It's a reasonable position to hold, but there are a few problems. First, such an attitude depends on whether Rome maintained and maintains its fidelity to the original faith. The rest of the church holds that Rome has not done so in a variety of ways. Many of these are minor, and just as we maintain relationships with others with whom we have minor differences, attempts were made to maintain unity with Rome. However, as Rome increasingly perceived itself as having more power and authority over others, such unity became increasingly difficult and even impossible. Christ's exhortation to the apostles was to be servants, not lords and masters. Rome's increasing attempts to impose its imagined power on others made it impossible to maintain both unity and truth. This was especially evident as Islam invaded and dominated the rest of the church with little or no aid from Rome, when Rome set up parallel churches and other patriarchates, and finally when military forces acting on behalf of Rome directly attacked the church in Constantinople. It's hard to remain, it is hard to maintain unity with someone when he ignores your pleas for help as he replaces you and your leaders with his delegates, and then as his delegates assault, rape, and murder you, your wives, and your children. This isn't to say that everyone has clean hands or that only Rome's hands are dirty. The grass isn't greener. One of the arguments for papal supremacy that Roman Catholic apologists often wield involves an observance of disunity among various Orthodox Protestant evangelical churches, and to be fair, the criticism has traction. The implication is that the lack of unity indicates some lack of authenticity on the part of the Orthodox churches. The church that Jesus started should be unified. However, the reality is that there's just as much disunity among various or various Roman Catholic groups. The difference is that the Roman Catholic Church defines the other groups as schismatic or otherwise no longer part of the club and so pretends that the Roman Catholic Church possesses some kind of unity that other churches and groups lack. There are two problems. One, division and difficulties among other groups doesn't make papal supremacy correct. And two, Roman Catholic Church has just as much disunity as the various Orthodox. It also is a source of disunity within Christianity through its attempts to impose papal supremacy upon the rest of the Church. Consider this, that the Great Schism it isn't purely a result of papal supremacy. There are many factors at play, spanning decades or centuries. But papal supremacy has been central and was central in it coming about. It's been central in its perpetuation. And it is a central factor today on preventing reunification among Christians. The unity or oneness is something that we seek and we believe can be found only in genuine submission to Christ. So in summary, Scripture provides us no clear teaching indicating that Peter had any kind of exclusive supremacy over the entire church. And indeed, there are multiple passages that suggest otherwise. The Roman Catholic Church itself asserts in its own authoritative councils that the keys were not given to Peter alone, but to all of the apostles. The common arguments for papal supremacy are generally non sequiturs. We also know from history that papal supremacy, though it might have been promoted by some individuals, was not the belief of the larger church. This all being the case, the lack of unity among Christians is first and foremost a result of our own stiff-necked sinfulness, mine and yours, and those who came before us. Roman Catholic apologists argue that the lack of unity also has to do with the refusal to accept papal supremacy. The reality, however, is quite the opposite. Papal supremacy and the attempt to impose it upon the rest of the church 
led to the greatest schism in church history, and one that continues and continues to spread to this very day. The solution is not submission to papal supremacy, but for Rome to stop pushing the erroneous belief. In all of the above, I do not intend any venom toward Roman Catholicism or any Roman Catholic apologist. Most parties in the discussion seem sincere, and I was persuaded by apologists' arguments in the 1990s to become Roman Catholic, and I engaged in such apologetics myself. Part of the reason that I know these arguments are flawed is having made them for years and then having scrutinized them more closely and seeing the mistakes in them. It's a common problem for us as apologists as we're critical of other people's arguments. Your argument's wrong and your argument, your argument's wrong this way and I can defeat that one. But we never turn that critical eye upon our own arguments, our own beliefs. Which is scary. It's scary to do. It was only as I matured and that I gradually discerned that these arguments for papal supremacy are fallacious. I'm still frustrated with myself over this, and I'm hopeful that the Holy Spirit may yet move the leadership in Rome to renounce the error of papal supremacy, and in doing so remove a gigantic obstacle to unity among Christians. What does this mean for Roman Catholics? Like any organization, the Roman Catholic Church has every right to establish criteria for membership, and it claims that a belief in papal supremacy is mandatory. The greater problem, though, is that there are no perfect churches, to my knowledge. That is, every major historically authentic Christian church that I can think of. One that can trace its contiguous existence to Jesus Christ via the apostles and their successors, either teaches things that were not part of the teachings of the early Christianity, or fails to teach and practice things that were. For example, the Chalcedonian Orthodox or Chalcedonian, if you prefer, uh, the Orthodox who accept Chalcedon and several subsequent councils, they assert that one must hold to the Chalcedonian definition of the hypostatic union as a matter of faith. A definition that was a philosophical definition basically uh, brought together in the 5th century, 500 years, 400, 500 years after Christ. The Protestant evangelical communities generally lack authentic sacraments, at least some of them, and also embrace a variety of very novel and demonstrably false concepts. The pre-Chalcedonian Orthodox, the Coptic, Armenian, and similar, seem theologically solid but have very restrictive cultures that effectively preclude participation by other nationalities. In general, the Old Catholics have largely embraced Contemporary cultural errors, such as homosexual marriage or other immoral activities. Altogether, today's truth seeker is in a position where there doesn't appear to be any perfect alternative, only a number of less than perfect ones. And overall, my advice to anyone trying nav to navigate this is to seek the church that helps you draw closer to Christ recognizing that this may vary depending on your personal circumstances. And in any event, I wouldn't recommend that current Roman Catholics leave Roman Catholicism over this error alone, for they'll only find themselves in some other church that just has a different set of problems. Where does it leave those considering Roman Catholicism? I think it's better to enter Roman Catholicism, knowing that, like any church, it has some flaws. It is certainly better than to go in thinking it is completely flawless and then to discover otherwise and have a crisis of faith or leave Christianity entirely, as so many have done. I'll leave the postscript and I'll leave a link to the paper in the, uh, in the video description below. Thank you for your patience in this time. You're welcome to leave any comments you like. Just Please keep them friendly and uh, happy. I'm happy to have a discussion with you, uh, with anybody who wishes to discuss this further. But God bless you.